I'm Biddy Alexson, Senior Fellow at the Nuffield Trust. I'm here today with Lord Crisp, Independent Member of the House of Lords and former Chief Executive of the NHS and Permanent Secretary of the Department of Health. We're here today to talk about the extent to which global exchange can spark new thinking about the future of the NHS. Nigel, it's been suggested that developed country health systems have reached the high watermark in terms of healthcare that's highly hospitalised, expensive and highly technical. Do you think there's an opportunity to create a new direction for healthcare? Well, I think the, the issue is that here in London, if you were to go to any of our big hospitals, you'd find that the big issues were lots of elderly people with multiple pathologies, lots of people with relatively complex sets of conditions. And we've always treated them in the past as in terms of just treating the medical condition. So whatever it is that they're presenting with, we try and deal with that. But in reality, what they need is something much more comprehensive in terms of care. Uh, I have a friend in Alaska, a man called Doug Eby, who talks about um, uh, when patients come to him, you know, if he's dealing with an old man with Parkinson's, for example, yes, of course, he will medicate for the Parkinson's, but actually what he also needs to do is to help him because he's not dressing himself properly, he's not eating, he's lonely, and so on. You know, you've got to think about the whole picture. And our healthcare system at the moment is geared towards the clinical aspects, but not to the whole of life aspects. And the fact that what these people really want, I think, uh, in general, is help to continue to be independent, help to be able to live their lives as independent people. So let's stick with London as the backdrop for our thinking. If we roll on 10 years' time, what do you think the landscape would look like if we followed through on some of the changes that you're describing? I think there'd be two big changes that, that I'd pick up. One would be there's much more integration of, of what in, in, in the UK we talk about as health and social care. So we've got social care services organised by local authorities, we've got health organised by the national government. There'll be much more coming together of those two with voluntary organisations and with all kinds of other organisations. And that'll be seen as the bedrock of the service that's provided. I think there's that. But the second thing that will change will be about training of health workers. Because we train health workers in silos, not just silos of doctors and nurses and physiotherapists, but silos of health workers as opposed to care workers or educationalists and so on. And I think we need to see um, people's concept of what health is and what to support people with their health is much more wide than it is now. So those will be the things, training and deploying staff differently and that interface between health and social care. There's a lot of talk at the moment about the consequences of the financial downturn. I wonder to what extent it might be a catalyst for bringing about the kind of change that you've described. I think there's an opportunity with the first, and, and it may be grasped, of, of linking together health and social care. Um, in the UK, again, uh, our coalition government has got some plans for devolving more authority to primary care doctors. Now, as it happens, it's towards doctors rather than to primary care as a whole, so I think there are some questions about quite what it will mean. But I do think pressure on resources potentially will force together health and social care. I'm much less optimistic about the changes in staff um, training and development and that's because there's so many vested interests you know people are bought into the way it's done now and actually to change fundamentally medical education uh, and, and so on I think will take longer um, cash pressures may help but it's a difficult one since you left the NHS you spent a lot of time traveling the world and a lot of time in particular in Africa and in your book turning the world upside down you mentioned several fantastic examples of innovation from low-income countries, for example, the Aravind Clinic in India or BRAC in Bangladesh. To what extent do you think there's a lot that we in the developed world can learn from these examples of innovation? Let me divide that into two bits. The, the specific examples that you've used, such as Aravind, or actually one in Africa is the treatment of clubfoot. Um, another one is the way that Mexico pioneered um, uh, conditional cash transfers as a way of getting to the poorest people in a society and helping them get access to health services. Some of those things you can actually translate across into the UK and, and for example the example that I would talk about of clubfoot, what has been developed and reused in Africa recently in, in treating clubfoot has now become best practice in the UK as well and in the US. So there are some specifics that come back but the much bigger issue is actually about the mindset. It goes back to my point about training. It's actually the point that if you're going to deliver healthcare, it's not just the, pr the, the prerogative of the professionals highly trained. It's actually about how people together can work at 
supporting health care. It's about the example of BRAC, which I think is such a wonderful example, where they don't treat health as separate from education or separate from employment. And they know if they've got a, a young mother with a child, yes, of course, they will try and help with the clinical aspects of the illness of the child, but how much more sustainable if they also help with the education of the mother so she knows how to do things better, um, but also about maybe getting her some employment or providing her some cash to start a business with microfinance and so on. Because all of these things link together. And in the West, we have segmented them. We've made health an industry, a little business, and we've uh, offshored it to the professionals, whereas actually, you know, we as individuals are actually responsible for our own health. So that brings us on to one of the important ideas in your book, which is the role of individuals and families, patients if you like, in the healthcare system. And you argue for patients having a greater role and more control. How do you think we could bring about that kind of change? Yeah, and actually there's quite a lot of good examples around. Um, and you see it, uh, and let me just take an example. I happen to remember being in Nottingham five years ago, looking at a, um, a programme that was set up for uh, chronic obstructive um, disease, uh, lung disease, um, and it was a program which had been set up by doctors but they had heavily involved patients in the design of it and in the deliver of it so that other people with COPD were actually part of the service and part of the induction of new patients into it but part of the delivery of service. So we've got models like that of people really engaged, we've got other models of citizens, juries and so on. And actually, funny enough, I think the most important thing we need to do is to give it more priority. Um, I'm very conscious that in the UK we delivered some big changes in the health service and we delivered them on our top three or four priorities. You know, we put all our effort into them. At the same time we said we wanted to get patients more involved and we got them more involved. But what would it have been like if we'd put that as our top priority? I think we would have seen more change. I think there are models around uh, and, and good examples and I think if we put real political will behind it uh, we could shift it. But again, the most important bit in getting that shift right and getting the priority is what happens in the minds of the professionals, because the professionals co control so much at the moment. They control the way we think about health, and that's why I think professional education is so important in getting that changing so that we can change the way we deliver services. What would the healthcare system gain if we were to put patients more in control? Well, I think there'd be two things. Um, the, there was actually a study done in, I think, 2001 by Derek Wanless in the UK which actually looked at three scenarios, um, one where we continued as now, um, uh, but the one which turned out to be both the highest quality and the cheapest was the one where patients were more engaged in their own care. It not only reduced costs, but it actually improved quality. And this was quite a systematic study uh, uh, of looking at that. So th there's that sort of point. But I think, it's, I think it's more than that. I think actually if you've got patients the public involved much more in their own health care, after all it is their own health care, and we as professionals should be seen as visitors in, in their lives rather than us as visitors in their hospitals, if you see what I mean. Um, uh, that, that I think there will be a great change in the people's perception of society, people's you know, wider set of issues about people's happiness, I suspect, and, and, and satisfaction that go beyond just the purely health issues where I think it'll be about quality and it'll be about money. So going back to the idea of health being intimately connected to other parts of life, this seems to be something that the developing world has held on to, the idea that you pursue health in yeah. order to pursue a job or economic productivity. But in the developed world, we're sort of driven by bureaucratic silos. Each part of public services is run by a different government department. How could we move away from that and embrace some of the thinking that's going on in the developing world around health and life being intimately connected? Well, y you will know, because you, you, the, the, as patients, or you, you often come across staff who manage to get things done despite the system. You, know? you hear doctors all the time say, I got it done despite the system. The system wasn't working, but I managed to make it happen. And that's the reality. You know, the systems are, are, are pretty tightly structured towards getting the results that they get. And sometimes you have to bend the rules and good professionals will, will bend the rules. So one of the things to do is to actually relook at the systems. You know? To actually say, if we had a system that was designed to help people to be independent, but that also looked after health, then you'd design the system differently. So I think fundamentally, you've got to take quite a fundamental look at the system, build it up bottom up from a, uh, a perspective of uh, of, of where people are in their lives and then see how healthcare adds into it. 
Um, and there are examples of this. Um, I can think of examples in, in, in the East End of London um, where community groups working with the NHS have very clearly set out um, you know, community facilities which include schools and housing and, and so on, of which health is a part. But health is only a part. And that's because they've, they've asked the question differently. They've asked what are they trying to achieve rather than just seeing health as a single goal. What you're describing is a really big change. And beyond political leadership, what kinds of things could take us further down this road? I think the first thing is to make it more visible. Um, I think in, in, in low and middle income countries there's some fantastic examples. I've already mentioned BRAC, but I th and you've mentioned Aravind. I, th I think there are lots of people who are pioneering different ways of doing things. I also think that in the UK and the US there are as well. And we just don't make them visible enough. Um, and we don't bring them together enough so that they can learn from each other. And, and I think that um, when the change starts to happen, it might happen really quite quickly. You know, there the, the will be a sort of paradigm shift, if you like, as the, uh, as there becomes a sort of critical mass. So it's not as if we're trying to, in, we, we know we've got a problem, we're trying to invent something totally new. Most of what's totally new is already out there. It's about bringing it to the forefront. And it's about knowing that disruptive change and innovation won't come from the status quo. It won't come from the authorities. It won't come from the lords and the permanent secretaries, generally. It'll come from the grassroots. It'll come from different places. It'll be the disruptive laptop as opposed to the mainframe computer. You know, it'll be all that kind. It'll be the car rather than the faster horse. You know, it'll be all those kind of things. But the examples are there. So it's a question of how do we, um, through the sort of conference you're leading, um, and through publication and so on, make these things more visible, make them more acceptable and, and get some energy and some momentum behind them. A lot of our thinking about health reform is really very focused on the system. We think about financing reform or payment mechanisms, competition, government regulation, but we don't think that much about how to motivate individuals within the system to do the job that essentially they, they join the system to do, to make people's lives better, to improve their health. That seems to be something that developing countries have got a better handle on. So BRAC, for example, is really tapping into individual motivation. What do you think we could learn from those kinds of examples? Yeah, I, I, th I think your analysis is absolutely right, and that we spend a lot of time talking about what I think of as second order things, you know, how you organize the system. And we make it extraordinarily complicated. You know, I, I spend a bit of time in America, and well, I'm sure the Americans can understand their system, but it's kind of difficult for a foreigner to, to see how it is complication on complication and you know what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do and so on. And, and of course in poorer countries you don't have that because you don't have all that baggage, you don't have all that, all that structure. I think the key thing is to reconceive the question, it's to ask what are we doing this for? You know? and, and those sort of questions are how do you make a health system work well? Whereas actually the question is how do we help people to be healthy? How do we help people to be independent? And once you ask those questions uh, first you get into the area of intrinsic motivation and so on. Let me t tell you a, a, a very simple story about a, a good friend of mine who's very disabled in the UK. Um, and she was in hospital in intensive care having difficulty breathing. And um, she overheard the doctor saying, well, if she, if, she, if she crashes, don't let's resuscitate her because her quality of life isn't really very good. And at that point, Jane swore she wasn't going to go to sleep for 48 hours just in case they did anything. And she sent her husband back home to get the picture of her receiving her PhD to put at the end of the bed to say, you know, this is the person who's in this bed, not the poor person grasping with her breathing. And, and, and you know, I, I, I got a video of that and I played it to chief executives in the NHS. And, and, and it was about what was happening in their hospitals. It was about people making judgments about other people's quality of life. Um, because the system sort of led you in that direction. And if we start by talking about what it is that people value, um, you can then get into what it is that staff value. And, and, and those are the sort of questions we should be starting with. So that if I were redesigning, and you can never do this, a health system from scratch, I'd be looking at one that actually supported people's independence, their ability to live a life they valued. You know, Jane's very disabled. And many of us might have thought, well, maybe we wouldn't want to live like that. But she does. You know? And she's the judge, not you know, any professional outside it. And you know, it's, it's true of us uh, at all stages in our life that, you know, and particularly as we get older, we learn to live with you know, limps and all kinds of stuff that younger people would find much more intolerable. 
Um, so that's where I'd start. I, I, I'd start by um, trying to refocus what it is we're doing, and that, I think, will allow us to reconnect with professionals' intrinsic wish. Um, but also there's a slight danger in using the word professional. It's actually people's intrinsic wish. To, you know, in general, people want to do things that are interesting and supportive and, and to work with others and to make a difference in life. So how do you make that happen? And it's not necessarily about regulation, which is you know, very often about sort of sticks and carrots and you know, mechanical things. They become important, but the question we should be asking is, what are we trying to do with our health system? And then how do you create the, the, the system, rather than starting by how do we tweak the system and forgetting the bigger question? It's true that starting from scratch would really be a thought experiment for most developed country systems. But in low and middle income countries, many of them are starting to build up their systems. So really they are starting somewhat from scratch. And if you were to advise them, what would you encourage them not to do, given all we've learned in um, the developed world? Well, I think, I, I think they would be adopt our health systems <laughs> and adopt a far too hospital and professional focused system. What, of course, they can gain from us is science. You know, none of what I'm saying is anti-science. You know, science is fantastic. And the genetic developments that we're seeing now will mean that for the first time we understand the mechanics of disease um, and that actually we will be able to target diseases. So there is, there is a whole section here where, which is highly scientific and really important that that is available to everyone in the world. And by and large, at the moment, those discoveries are happening in, in rich countries. You know, in, in time that'll, that'll shift, but that's where they're coming from. So they need that. I also need, think they need some of the systems thinking and, and, and the organisational concepts. But what they don't need is the emphasis on hospital, the emphasis on treating uh, health as if it's separate from everything else. And we unconsciously take it with us. You know, I'm in Africa and I meet British aid workers and they think in terms of the NHS because that's what they know. I meet American aid workers and they think in terms of insurance because that's what they know. Um, actually, what I'm saying to governments I'm working with in Africa is, so what are your people doing that's interesting? You know, are the stuff that you're inventing and creating that you want to build um, from? And very often there is. You know, the, the, the stuff which um, you wouldn't want to try and create, recreate the NHS, or you wouldn't want to try and create the French or the American system or anything. You, you want to create the, the Ugandan system. You know, build on the good things that are already there. Borrow from abroad but also learn from other middle-income countries or low-income countries. Um, I was recently in Brazil with the South African Minister of Health because the South Africans were looking at the Brazilian health system because they have the same GDP per head of the population and so on. And there's a lot of learning, I think, that can come that way. As you know, we're also interviewing Julio Frank for the conference. And you and Julio are good friends and colleagues, and I'm sure you've shared many ideas about the role of global exchange in health reform over the years. But if there was one question you could ask him, what would it be? Well, I'd always be interested to listen to what Julio thinks the future looks like. But I guess one specific question I'd, I, I'd ask Julio is from his experience in Mexico, thinking as the Mexican Minister of Health, what would he be saying to the Americans at the moment that they should be doing, you know, that would be worth borrowing from America? Because he did some really innovative stuff about health as opposed to health systems. And it'd be interested to know how, how he would see that translated into um, uh, the most system-focused country of the, uh, and money-focused uh, country of the lot. Nigel, that's great. Thanks very much for joining us.